I love deleted scenes from movies and TV shows because they show us what could have been, and it's great to wonder what kind of impact they would have had on the final product if they were still left intact. But today we're going to be looking at the opposite, deleted scenes from a film that will never see the light of day, or at least a version of that film, one that isn't even set to release until next summer. I present to you the deleted storyline from the third Spongebob movie, It's a Wonderful Sponge. Nick, 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 the Nick, 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 Nick Tando. As of the making of this video, It's a Wonderful Sponge just entered full production a few weeks back as a fully CGI film that's inspired by It's a Wonderful Life and will act as an origin story for the cast, with the opening sequence being set at Camp Coral, where all the characters meet. So much about the report that contained this information rubbed me the wrong way. This was my first real impression on the movie, and they made an effort to specifically mention that there were going to be lots of celebrities in the soundtrack, and that it would be directed by the man behind Hop and Alvin and the Chipmunks. Look, if I was seven, or anywhere in the target demographic, I would be eating this news up. Like, we'll get to see Bikini Bottom in full 3D and learn about the character's past. But that's the problem right there. For a franchise that's made a name for itself appealing to all ages and all kinds of people, It's a Wonderful Sponge looks like it's trying to be marketable rather than just entertaining. I could be completely wrong about this since I've yet to see a single finished frame from the film, but that's my first impression. But what if the movie wasn't all CGI, or had nothing to do with summer camp, or It's a Wonderful Life? What if this movie was about Spongebob traveling to the surface to fight an empire of evil alien cats? It would have been the coolest movie ever, that's what! If this sounds like something from a weird first draft of a screenplay, then you would be absolutely correct. Last month, the fine folks over at the encyclopedia Spongebobby Wiki found four brief silent animatics on the online portfolio of animation storyboard artist Rudy Bloss under a section titled Spongebob Movie 3. These clips show roughly four minutes of what Spongebob creative director Vincent Waller confirmed to be a first pass at the story that was later tossed out and rewritten. All of the boards appear to be pretty cleaned up, making me wonder how far along this idea got through the production pipeline before it was shelved. I've been able to deduce a lot about this movie's original storyline and general direction from this group of random scenes, so let's discuss them one by one, starting with the most mundane and the one I suspect would have come first. We begin with something straight out of a regular episode. SpongeBob and Patrick rush to Sandy for help, but are too startled to explain themselves. Sandy seems to ask them to calm down, and Patrick responds by digging a worm up from the ground. Clearly, I'm missing some context here. Sandy seems to have some idea or grasp on the situation, to which SpongeBob responds to by gleefully doing a lap around the tree dome and dragging his friends out into Bikini Bottom, without even noticing that Sandy is almost naked. Without dialogue, I have nothing to say about this scene. It seems that it would have helped the plot move along and was likely included in this portfolio to show off what the storyboard artist could do with an exposition-heavy scene. The only other interesting thing here is that Sandy's fixing up a one-person doom buggy when the scene begins, which could have been used to transport the cast or maybe in an action sequence. There was a car chase cut from the second SpongeBob movie, Sponge Out of Water, where SpongeBob and Plankton were pursued by an apocalyptic mob. Also, for whatever reason, one of the jokes from that scene ended up in the Lego Movie 2. A weird coincidence but one that makes sense, considering that both films shared the same director. It's like it knows our every move. Weird, right? Emmett. What? With the second sequence, we get into the good stuff. It begins with a massive fleet of spaceships shaped like cats flying down. We get a brief glimpse into the interior of one of these ships. I would have loved to see this shot fully painted and detailed. The bay doors of the lead ship open to reveal this hooded emperor or commander cat. This guy looks awesome. I love how his hood covers him and moves with his tall body. Plus, all of his expressions are really powerful and sinister. This commander is shocked to find that his armada has landed in front of a moderately sized suburban home, and he scolds his carefree lieutenant, whose design reminds me a bit of Officer Clawhauser from Zootopia, while the look of the other soldiers remind me of Avocado from Final Space. Concerning the last cat that we saw rendered in the Spongebob art style was this unappealing jerk, this sequence here gives me high hopes that this film would have had a really strong art direction and design team. These cats also have the resources to be genuinely intimidating and threatening villains, which is a rarity for Spongebob antagonists. So I would have been really interested to learn more about their motivations and see them interact with characters like Plankton. 
Felicitations, malefactors! I am endeavoring to misappropriate the formulary for the preparation of affordable comestibles! Who will join me? I don't get it. The only concern that this sequence brings up is that I'm not sure what is supposed to be animated in what style. Now the alien cats and their ships look like they were designed to be rendered in 2D, but the location that they end up on is on the surface. So if they were planning to keep in line with the visual style set by Sponge Out of Water, the location would be live action and the characters would be in CGI. Now take this observation with a grain of salt, because storyboards are merely a blueprint for any animated production, and artists often take liberties with character designs. I think a Roger Rabbit style 2D and live action blend would have looked the best considering what we see here, but knowing how much the CGI in Sponge Out of Water was pushed by its marketing, I'd expect that kind of stuff to be prominent in It's a Wonderful Sponge. Alright, this third sequence is the meatiest of them all. We begin in the same setting as the last scene, with the lieutenant cat stuck in a tree, because, ha, huh, they're cats. Suddenly, SpongeBob uses a rope to jump off a small spaceship piloted by Sandy, Patrick, and Squidward and tries to reason with the alien cats, which only results in a couple of buff soldiers shooting at the main characters, including a Sandy who looks to be sporting a slightly different astronaut suit without an air helmet. No idea how the other undersea characters can breathe air, or why they look to be human-sized, but I bet that would have been hand-waved like it was in Sponge Out of Water. Additionally, the Commander Cat is seen here with a wrench in hand, which I only bring up because Sandy also had a wrench in the first scene we looked at. Either this is an odd coincidence, or wrenches may have been central to the plot in some way. The gang is chased through the yard around Garden Decor and escape into an open window using SpongeBob as a bounce pad. From this point on in the scene, Sandy and Squidward disappear, and Spongebob and Patrick bump into a boy and girl who look and act just like them, reminding me of a small cut moment from the original Spongebob movie that I've talked about before. Now one of my biggest fears for the live action stuff in Sponge Out of Water was that we were going to do the generic storyline of having the cartoon characters befriend nobodies in the real world and tie in some unneeded subplot, and this scene kind of brings those fears to fruition. However, it gets a pass for me because it's simple, it's charming, and it gets right to the point, as the duos quickly communicate and draw out a plan. Now, it's likely that there would have been another scene or two with these characters that explains why these kids don't immediately call the cops, but for what we have here, I enjoy where this scene goes, and the whole kids versus cats fight is another moment I would have loved to see fully realized. It feels like a step up from the climax of Sponge Out of Water, with how the characters interact with the environment around them, and it's nice to see a major battle take place within a small location instead of a sprawling city. It's got the cosmic stakes of the Avengers with the setting of Home Alone, and that juxtaposition of elements makes this fight really appealing to me. The fourth and final scene opens up with SpongeBob and Gary piloting a dolphin spaceship with a ball of yarn tied behind it that is being followed by this celestial cat. There's a lot to take in from just this one image. The dolphin spaceship is likely connected to Bubbles, the protector of the universe with an Illuminati motif seen in Sponge Out of Water. Because dolphins, space, you get the similarity. This giant space cat is really out there upon first glance, but I suppose it could be the leader of the alien cats or some kind of Voltron transformation made up of all the cats in the army. We don't see much of the big kitty in this sequence as SpongeBob and Gary are headed straight for a black hole that is sucking them in. As the visuals become more intense, the duo accepts their fate and we see the time they've spent together flash before their eyes. If this moment was faster or involved more flashbacks that didn't look like they belonged in a music video montage, I could buy the emotion that they're trying to sell here, but without any audio, it's just weirdly melodramatic, and not quite funny or touching enough to be a great scene. There's a fraction of a joke that the animatic cuts off, where Spongebob rolls up the window to the spaceship after some alien bug splats on it. It's not only a joke that's been done before, but it also clashes with the tone presented by the rest of the scene. The theme of pets seems to be very important to this version of the film, with the focus on cats and the undersea version of a cat, and I wonder how that would have been explored through the conflict. But out of all four sequences, this one reeks of being from a rough draft the most, and it feels like Spongebob the least, despite not even being the one that has the most new ideas. Anyway, that's it. It's likely that this is all we will ever see from this version of It's a Wonderful Sponge. That probably wasn't even going to be the title anyway. I would have gone for a cat-related pun, like Catastrophe, Apocalypse, Meow, and my personal favorite, Catfished. The fact of the matter is that we'll never get answers to so many lingering questions from these animatics. We'll never know why Patrick dug up that worm, 
why this house or these kids were important? What was up with this random portrait in the background? How many more tiny details were there that I could overanalyze? And if SpongeBob has a secret vendetta against furries? It's easy to forget that this film has been in production since at least November of 2015, with tons of writers and SpongeBob crew members coming and going, as it's been produced alongside a couple seasons of the series. If this movie hadn't been delayed at least two times, there's a chance that it would have come out this week, as its very first release date was February 8th of 2019. But as for this odd scrap version, I for one would have welcomed our new cat alien overlords. I love whenever Spongebob does weird sci-fi stories, and this direction feels very big and cinematic. I have no idea how they would have been able to bring everything to screen, but this feels like an extension of the fun spirit and innovation seen in Sponge Out of Water. But despite how much it seems to have changed over the past few years, I'm still looking forward to It's a Wonderful Sponge as we know it. I mean, it is Spongebob, so of course I'm going to watch it. That's the only reason why I was looking forward to this year's Super Bowl. It may no longer involve Spongebob having a near-death experience, or Squidward staring at the covered-up crotch of a garden-sized statue, but hey, not everything can be perfect, can it? 